Uh oh, two Chris's. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold Hi. Here. We're live. You've come for another hour to hang out at the view. Today we're excited to talk about blogging in the blogosphere with special guest Chris Walton. I'm Meg Riley here in Minneapolis where it's going above zero today. I went out and uh, changed the bird food quick. Done, you know, did all that quick while I could stand to be out there. So um, I'm going to have the regulars introduce themselves before we get going. Reverend Shade, you want to start? Hi, I'm Tom Shade, and I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's 10 degrees here today, <laughs> and uh, my little dogs are like uh, they have to be pushed out of the door with a snow shovel to get them to go to go outside. I don't know. Is, is that a it. euphemism? Is that a euphemism, Tom? <laughs> What? I never say anything. No. They just do push down the side. They never want to go out. You know? Oh, get your head. Come on. Go ahead. All right, Hank. You're <laughs> talking. Keep going. Hi, I'm Hank Perth. I'm speaking to you from lovely, chilly Medford, Mass., which is a balmy 24 uh, in comparison to uh, uh, my colleagues here. All right. Patrice, come on in. Hi, I'm Patrice Curtis. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area and much to some of your shocks it's right around freezing so 32 wow. so it does wow. get cold here wow. Wow. and Reverend Crawford hi I'm Joanna Fontaine Crawford I am in Houston where it is finally below 70 degrees I think it's it's actually in the 40s <laughs> right now <laughs> la, la, la. so we're enjoying it we're breaking out all of the uh, the, the holiday sweaters and whatnot oh you, mean, you know this Look at holiday holiday sweater Christmas. thing yeah I, Christmas uh, Cap, they, they, that you they, they, have behind her I mean Joe look at uh, that. The misfit toys. I told y'all I'm a Christmas lover. I'm a, oh, I'm a Christmas cool. lover, and apparently a, that's a really unusual thing. The uh, senior minister at my church is Daniel O'Connell. <laughs> we were talking to him about a sermon that he's going to be giving the, the Sunday before uh, Christmas, and it, he was kind of headed down, you know, towards some negativity. And we may we all work collaboratively, and we said. Uh, Maybe don't do that. And he, he looked at me and said, why? And I said, because, Daniel, some people like Christmas. <laughs> and he just, he just kind of looked at me like, you know, your lips are moving, but I'm not. <laughs> uh, Daniel is Hank's uh, soulmate, I think, on this. Yes. <laughs> As we introduced Mr. Scrooge last week. Uh, we have uh, Google, as usual, is playing games with us. But we're going to have Scott show you this new feature that we're excited about. Scott, a.k.a. the tech guy, Scott Yeomans, who is... Scott, say hello, tell us where you are, and show us this new feature, would you? Sure. Hi, good morning, and welcome. I'm over in uh, Erie, Colorado. We're expecting 50-degree uh, weather today, or at least high 40s, Ooh. so very happy about that. And I'm glad you're here with us today. I want to show you a new way to interact with the hosts on The View. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, you're going to notice in the lower left-hand corner of the screen that there's a yellow kind of quote icon and a phrase that says, be part of the conversation, click to join live Q&A on Google Hangouts. In the past, you haven't been able to ask questions directly of the hosts. You've posted in comments, and I've forwarded those, or the tech person has forwarded them to the host, but now you get to ask them directly. <clears throat> so let's see what happens when we click on this. Ooh, oh, that's amazing. Ooh. It takes you to the <laughs> Hangout page. And then over here on the right, I can see other questions, and I can then click this green button that says Ask a New Question, where I can say something like, What was the name of the lion on the island of King Misfit? Moonraiser! King Moonraiser! <laughs> <laughs> no, you are busted, Hank. You are not the curmudgeon you pretend to be. I, I, I had a friend whose band was called King Moon Rage. That's the only reason. Oh, the only reason. Man, oh. man, you liar. You know, somebody, it looks like, already asked us to wear ugly sweaters next week. Or did, did, <laughs> the next week, everyone wear their best. That was Tim, of course. Tim, anyway, a social media guy. I, I, hope I think that you that's a great idea, Tim. <laughs> well, I hope you all enjoy using the new feature, and I hope you enjoy the rest of today's view. Thank you for watching. 
Yeah, thanks a thanks lot. And God. do join in. I wish we could just pull you in to chat with us, but at least you can come in conversationally and we can re see it and respond, or in the case of very inappropriate things, just quietly ignore them. <laughs> thanks, uh, Scott. Yeah, I think you can turn off your, uh, and put your little chalice back up. But maybe you like having that as your little image. So let's get to our guest who is here. Not only him, but his twin brother are here at the minute. Uh, <laughs> Chris, you know, sometimes Google just does that. Sometimes when my family talks, they're like seven of my sister. I don't know why. But I'm glad I you're here. I thought I was closing a window and instead <laughs> opened another one. There you go. Chris is the editor-in-chief. Is that your title at the world? It's a simple title, just editor. Okay. Chris has been editor of the UU World for a number of years. How many? Give us a number there. Well, I've been editor for five years. I've been on the staff since 2000. Uh, so many of us know him in writing, know his name very well, but he also has been blogging. He's one of the earliest UU bloggers, at least, that I became aware of, and so we thought we'd start by just talking about kind of the evolution of blogging as you've observed it, particularly within UUism, but kind of in general, and some of the people here are very active bloggers, some not, so we're going to just talk about uh, blogging in Unitarian Universalism today. So Chris, what do you got to say? Sure, well... Uh just the very short backstory is that um, I became aware of blogs as personal publishing platforms uh, right around 9-11 and uh, a couple of journalists adopted them that I became aware of. Uh, you know, Andrew Sullivan was very early and then uh, Josh Marshall who later launched Talking Points Memo, uh, he started blogging and I became aware of both of them and uh, then the media critic for the Boston Phoenix, a Unitarian mm -hmm. Universalist named Dan Kennedy, started blogging, and I thought, oh, I, I'm interested in this. And right at that point, uh, as I started looking into how to do it, uh, Scott Wells in Washington uh, mm -hmm. also started it. And I pretty quickly started looking around for you know, who were other Unitarian Universalists doing this? And uh, I found a couple, and within, I don't know, maybe six months, I had started to make a little list of uh, who was out there uh, blogging and ever commenting on Unitarian Universalism. We weren't really having a conversation about Unitarian Universalism at the time, but probably within that first year, we started doing that, and um, uh, BeliefNet changed some of their forum rules at the time, and this whole group of people who had been active in the UU conversations on BeliefNet abandoned BeliefNet and all set up their own blogs. So you saw uh, Chalice Chick uh, became very prominent in that, uh, Fausto the Socinian uh, had a blog, and, and um, Tom set up one about that time, uh, and so this was this was really 2002, 2003, 2004. Um, I sort of think of as the 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 heyday of UU blogging, only because there was this uh, tight, highly responsive, uh, mm -hmm. voluble group um, uh, yammering away at each other. Uh, we didn't really attract a very large audience, but we had a, a lot of fun, and some of it you can still find uh, out there. A lot of the blogs have, have vanished or, you know, Tom has launched himself two or three different times. Uh, I don't know where your archives went, Tom, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> you, can find, you can find links to his long-expired posts on, uh, on Philocrates, which is my <laughs> blog. Um, yeah. I kept mine going. Uh, mine was active until I... Uh, took over the magazine when Tom Stites retired, and then I simply completely ran out of time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my wife and I, we had our first child, and that took all the remaining time. So I haven't blogged uh, really in the last five years. I so that, that's, that's the story that I've really been closely connected to. I mean, the, there are other things I could tell you about, but that's sort of the, the short version. Uh, the last thing I'd say about it is when I last updated my guide to Unitarian Universalist blogs, probably in 2007, uh, there were several hundred uh, 
that I had identified at that time. And uh, uh, the site uh, updates, uupdates.net, uh, basically became an RSS aggregator for UU blogs. And it's still, uh, it's still active, but I'm not sure that all UU bloggers know that you can add your blog URL there and all of your posts will show up and people can find you that way. So. And Chris, I, I, I have to, to uh, point out, you got a pretty famous shout out of your blog, right? Yeah, it was very funny to wake up one morning and have several email messages in my inbox saying, uh, Chris, your blog was on The Daily Show last night, which is one of those sentences that doesn't really compute. You know, what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, but there was a very funny segment on the new media uh, that Rob Cordry did, and uh, it took me about two hours that morning to find someone who had uh, captured the segment uh, as it was happening and put it online, and then I was able to watch it and see that I was uh, – a screenshot of my blog was used to illustrate how liberal blogs uh, uh, were hoity-toity and, and uh, used obscure language. Uh, yes. So, obscure and literary, obscure right? Obscure and literary was the yes, phrase that, yes. uh, <laughs> that he said as, as my uh, screenshot went by. So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> awesome. I noticed, you're talking about time, I noticed that in those earlier years of blogging, I only blogged consistently when I was on sabbatical. Mm. That, uh, as soon as I, I would start up the blog, when you talk about launching it uh, over and over again, it was because I would go on sabbatical or summer vacation. I'd come home from GA and I'd be all fired up and I'd start blogging and then, you know, as soon as fall hit, it would just like, well, once every two weeks, once every four weeks and then you just put it aside. It's, you know, it's a time consuming thing. Now I'm retired and so, you know, I'm back in the gig. Now you're an unstoppable force. <laughs> I'm an unstoppable, I'm a torrent of, you know, <laughs> of uh, opinion, you know, so. The guy needs a pulpit. Well, you know, <laughs> he does. I don't have he to has get, one. It's called I, I don't blog. Have to get dressed up and you know, and well, uh, I, worry about whether the choir is going to be in tune. You know, <laughs> so. Well, back in those golden days, I think one of the the real benefits is that, and you were talking about this earlier, Chris, about the conversations that were happening. Um, I came in um, about. 2004. So I, I think I think of myself as like the second wave of, of mm -hmm. blogs. It seems like uh, Christine Robinson. Mm -hmm. um, I came on. There were uh, several of us, and um, it was it was a very interesting time because people would get into knock down dragouts um, in a really great way. You know, <laughs> arguing about Unitarian Universalism, life, what church should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that well, kind of your thing, memory? So one of the things that that has changed is that the original, the first two generations of blogs uh, grew out of a very different conversational form than the ones are now. So the first generation of us were um, uh, alumni of the old UUs-L email list, and before that there was a Usenet group, and those were um, bruising, uh, sort of brawling conversations about Unitarian Universalism, and in one sense they did not put our best face forward. Uh, but between those groups, which is where, where I had gotten my first introduction to UU conversation, and BeliefNet, which was also um, similar. I mean, these were sort of lay people dominated, um, somewhat contentious conversations. And some of that uh, conversational quality is what moved into the blogosphere first. The other thing was that a bunch of the early UU bloggers uh, were identified with the UU Christian community, and so they, they were coming from sort of a particular angle. I mean, they sort of, as a community, moved online and started having a public conversation. Scott but Wells. Scott and Wells, were, for example. And there were a bunch of us um, who were blogging uh, anonymously. I, I right. was one. I was Lizard Eater. Oh. And, you know, there... <laughs> 
Shocked. This is still happening. Breaking news. I have to say, this, this is, it's like being famous in this really... It, it's I didn't being know that, in this and really I, little world. And, uh, wait, so who's Chalice Chick? Susan Smith Webb. Oh. I don't think I, I'm I out of here. I I mean, I'm, I'm Chalice Chick. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna back up a second because Joanna, I think you have a great story to tell um, mm -hmm. uh, about how blogging connected you. Well, um, and I'm and I'm and, and that's this is why when we were talking about blogging. Chris was the first name um, that came to my mind, not only for the very logical reasons, but also a very emotional one. And um, I had started blogging in 2004 because I started seminary, and I did it anonymously because um, I was at an evangelical seminary. <laughs> and uh, I thought I might be blogging stuff that I didn't want them to see. And then about a late year later, as a lot of people know, my baby daughter was diagnosed with cancer. And the anonymity was wonderful because I didn't have to protect anyone's feelings. I could just I could just be completely truthful. I could just pour out everything. And um, I, you know, I, I already hero worshipped Chris Walton, you know. And this one day he posted on his blog um, a post about my blog and talked about how this was affecting his prayer practice. And, I mean, you know, to, to know that when, when you're in that much pain, to know that someone out there is reading and it's affecting their life was just, just affected me so much. And I've told Chris this before, but I'll, I will say it again. It, it really was a life-giving thing. Um, and so that's how I came to know Chris Walton. Well, and, and watching that blog attract a community of people, some of whom you already knew, but many of whom you did not. I mean, that, that to watch a support network grow up around personal stories that, that you were telling, I mean, that there are a lot of people in the, the sort of larger world of blogs. That was the most remarkable thing about it, was people finding um, really, really deep connections just through a voice, you know, not, you, you might never have met in person, but sometimes those did lead to people meeting in person or forming, you know, lasting personal relationships. So, uh, and that, that I think really touched on the capacity of writing not just as uh, a form of, of argument or promotion, but, but a way of giving a glimpse into what the religious life was like, what the personal life was like, what it was like to really wrestle uh, with, with life questions. And you could see on a blog like yours, and there were a couple of others like it, you could see the way that Unitarian Universalists would be religious. You know, that they, the way they would express care for other people, the way they would, um, the, the way they would pray by commenting. I mean, it was, that was very powerful. And I think that some of that has actually continued. I mean, many of the blogs that UU World follows with our interdependent web uh, weekly roundup now are actually these these personal voice blogs, not the, um, I mean, there's not so many of the, uh, there's not as much argument going on in the blogosphere anymore, but, but many of the personal voices are still going. Right. I'm going to interject a question here. There, there are people, um, I'm delighted that there are people actually using this question and answer thing. Um, one of them, I think, and Dee, Dee if I am uh, so wrong on your name, please type the uh, phonetic spelling and I won't do it a second time, but just said a lot of the conversations that used to happen in blogs are now happening on Facebook. And she asks, what would you say got lost due to that transition? Hmm. Well, the, the biggest thing that got lost is um, access for people who are not already inside some circle of conversation. I mean, on Facebook, you know, many people, their Facebook account is set to just their friends or maybe to the friends of their friends or maybe for some ministers it's actually even more tightly contained than that. Um, and so if I see a great conversation started on Facebook, I don't actually know 
who's privy to that conversation. And it's not, you can't find it with a Google search. Uh, you may not be able to find it two weeks from now. Uh, so once you've had that conversation, it's gone, and it was only available to some select audience to begin with. There's some ways around that, um, but uh, but most you know if if you just have a personal Facebook page and that's where you're having your conversations, uh, they're they're semi-public, but they're not they're not remotely as public as they would be on a blog. You can go to my blog now and still see everything that people said on a particular topic uh, seven years ago. Um, and sometimes people write to me and say, you know, I'm a very different person than I was now. Can I unsay that? <laughs> <laughs> well, but, we all feel that the way. the biggest thing that got lost. Yeah. And, and I think also the, 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 the difference ahead. in length. Um, you know, the fact that Facebook... Sometimes, it, or a lot of times to me, it feels like Facebook is more coffee hour while the blogs were, you know, your, your small group that you're in where you can just really open up and really explore some things, mm -hmm. you know, go deep. I mean, I, it's, it's hard to go deep in, you know, mm -hmm. an inch of type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would agree Dieter, with that. I mean, uh, Joanna, <laughs> did, did, did Lizard Eater have a UU and a non-UU audience? And I'm going to pull in yeah. a question from Shauna here that says, how do you write in a way that engages both UU and non-UU audiences? I mean, for mine, it, it, was, it wasn't it was UU and non-UU audiences. It was that I had a whole bunch of different audiences. I had cancer audience. I had mommy audience. I had UU audience. I had seminarians of, of all different type audience. And, um, you know, one, one of the the uh, the benefits of doing the blog the way that I did is I I didn't really think that much about the audience because I was blogging anonymously I could just put it all out there and and if someone had a question or didn't relate you know they'd often put something in comments and a conversation would happen there and he, and that brings up a, another question from a viewer that I think is really interesting. Do you think writing anonymously and and Chris, you also wrote anonymously. Tom, I don't know if you've ever written anonymously. And Hank is so anonymous we don't even know. But um, do you think having a real name versus you know another name changes the way it, people relate to the blog? Well, it depends on what you're doing. I mean, there's um, there's some even, nasty anonymous blog. <laughs> yeah, I mean even. I never posted anonymously, but I but I did use the name Philocrates as my you know persona, and partly that was uh, out of recognition that when you're writing uh, just on your own, uh, you can you're you're kind of performing something. I mean, you you're taking on a role and you're doing particular things with it. So I was. Um, I mean, with Philocrates, what, what Vicky did under the uh, Peace Bang name, uh, definitely what Chalice Chick did, was we were, we were writing in a, in a guise, you know, and so my guise focused what I was doing on the blog, and it, it gave me a way of always knowing I'm, I'm doing this kind of thing. I think Chalice Chick did the same thing. It was like it, it gave her a way of um, sort of focusing what kind of UU angle she was taking. Mm. Um, blogging under your own name is a way of, um, I think, asserting some sincerity about what you're saying. Mm. Uh, and it, I think it can build, uh, I think it can build trust, but, but I have to say, I mean, what Joanna, what Joanna was doing under a pseudonym was more candid than what she could have been doing at the time under her own name. Mm -hmm. And seminarians definitely face this. I mean, seminarians who have tried to um, blog under their own name uh, often find that's a very awkward, you know, getting to mm -hmm. know the role in front of everybody when, you know, people are going to 
read all of that when they're searching, you know, ministry packets five years from now. That's a that's an awkward proposition. Yeah. But there were some seminarians blogging anonymously um, about their CPE experience, and that totally blew up on them. So it's I mean, some I, I would just say some of the most powerful things that bloggers wrote, they did so anonymously. Some of the most powerful things that UU bloggers have written, they wrote under their own name. And it's uh, and the internet makes both of those things possible. I would say that people tend to comment more respectfully <laughs> under their own name. And so I think avoiding uh, anonymous commenters is often a very helpful thing. Right. And I, I think that the issue of uh, promotion also now, because when we were blogging, there was no Facebook. Now there's Facebook. And so if you want to promote, you know, and I think at, at, at least with my now public blog that I have, Boots and Blessings, the majority of the hits that I get have come through Facebook. So if you want to promote your blog, how can you do it if it's an anonymous blog without people knowing that it's you? And, and actually, I had to make a choice at a certain point of, okay, if I start blogging some of the Lizard Eater posts, secret's out. Secret yeah. was pretty much out at that point anyway. So. I was going to say, I don't think I outed you. Um, no, no, no. no. I, was gonna, and I was going to, to thank Chris for his comments because as the, the one person here who's still on the other side, or, uh, in process, shall we say, um, I definitely do, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of that, you know, of the voice that I put out at this point. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty close to seeing the NFC, so I'm yeah. obviously not a seminarian and not quite in the same level of uh, trying to find myself, definitely not. But I am very aware that <laughs> well, it may be easier that once I get through the MFC process. That this was is a how we train our... This is Let's, how we train our seminarians to be bold and prophetic ministers by making them nervous yeah. right. and, uh, and anxious for at least six years as they go through the process. So they're thoroughly spooked by the time they get into ministry and well, have learned how to anticipate every possible criticism that somebody could make. And then we I, wonder why we're... Uh, <laughs> I think that as ministers speaking publicly, you know, um, we can't be snarky. We can't be snide and sideways. We might do that privately. We might mm -hmm. like to do that. But if that's our public voice, we've lost all credibility right there. We, and so I think, we, yeah, there's a lot of... We Weinstein to talk about, about we should. that. Because if you look over the long history of her blogging, and, uh, you know, the... She stepped in a lot of, uh, of the potholes that are out there in terms of being uh, snarky and being funny and being unintentionally um, unintentionally upsetting to people, you know, mm -hmm. she, she's she's been yeah. on the front lines with that. So. It's, yeah, it's about the the unintentional. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, and also the you know the if there's uh, any you know questioning of empire or the way things are done or, I mean, uh, you know, even well, and even in a respectful. Could we have a conversation about how well, we do X, Y, or Z? It's yeah. Yeah. a difference of opinions. I wanted yeah. to bring in Scott, uh, who commented that there's an element of trust and focus that comes up in blogs because people are writing to a narrower audience, whereas Facebook comments you're making to the people you went to high school with. You know, you I mean, you, you know, it's such a broad, a broad brush that you're having Your conversations family. with on Facebook, right? So I wondered if other people uh, agree with that. That that there's a different voice that comes through because bloggings are more specific, blogs more specific. I mean, I think it was, it, it was interesting that even though blogs were taking place way out in public, that in a way uh, it felt less public to be uh, talking in the comments of someone's blog post than it does on Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, there was much less overhearing by people who uh, just see a notification that you've commented on some public page and like, what? You know, I only know them from the co-op and here they are, you know, saying something about God knows what. So that happens on Facebook. You don't see that on uh, mm -hmm. most blog comments. Mm -hmm. And there was really only one way to have a conversation 
around the blog and that was on the blog itself or on your blog and you and it was considered you know good etiquette to go back to the first blog and leave a little comment that would say something like Tom I'm going to be talking about you on mine um, but now with Facebook you know one of the things that I've seen is I get very few comments or zero comments on my blog post but then when I post the link to it on Facebook that's mm -hmm. where people will leave you the comments mm -hmm. so you're not getting that public conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what about Twitter <laughs> are people you know I use Twitter only to uh, actually I use Twitter to feed Facebook to feed the blog right you know I mean I put a Twitter notice out there which shows up on Facebook which then drives people drives people is probably you know you know directs people to the uh, to the blog but you know you get all kinds of like uh, you know you're in a much you know Twitter is like throwing something into the universe you know and uh, there may be a few little tags on it that help people find it and you may have some people that follow it but God only knows who reads your Twitter stuff which but because of tags on Twitter you can actually direct a lot I mean depending on what hashtags you put on it you oh, can sure. make I mean so in a way it's much more directed than Facebook where to me that's where you're really just throwing it out so yeah, but the Twitter goes I mean the Twitter goes out there it and, does and yeah the Facebook you know the hashtags kind of narrow it but given the fact that you're being followed by all these people and they're being followed and they may retweet yeah. and you're being followed, all of a sudden you're out there into like well I just get you know some things you know huh. people show up following me because of stuff they were retreated that I've never heard of and never seen and have no idea how they connected. Okay, well, three people have asked this question now. Okay. What is a blog exactly? So I'm going to just take us back to that. So the, the very simple version is a blog is a very easy publishing tool that allows you to uh, publish whatever you want uh, in chronological order and uh, it's it's essentially a name for um, a simple self-publishing platform. An online is, journal. Is, is blog An Germanic online journal, yeah. or is it Latin? Is the is this term blog Germanic or Latin? What's the root? Of that? <laughs> I think it's or Latin. Is that like root, or is it, actually, or, or is it right? Or, or is it like a? Uh, uh, is there like? Uh, um, should you use blogs to call blogs? Really? Should we? <laughs> the root of blog is Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> blogs. Blug. That sounds very, very sweet. I mean, right? some people definitely use <laughs> it as a, as a journal. Some people use it as a simple way to uh, publish photos. Some people, I mean, there's, um, like, it's a general term, but you can do anything you want with it. Yeah. What's well, the, my, um, the uh, web blog? Oh. It was a web blog. Okay, so web blog. I, I first, um, uh, uh, I, you know, the, the hot stove report where I follow the, uh, you know, who's going to what church, um, uh, started off uh, first on a blog, um, uh, which was actually much, uh, people were, felt much freer to talk about who was going to what church and, and their opinions of that um, than on Facebook, where I'm uh, constantly, uh, um, luckily not constantly, but I, I'm, I'm much more aware that I, of, uh, of, of having to set rules about what people are going to say about People going to certain churches and you know and and their opinions on those things. Come on, Hank, um, you banned people. Oh, I ban people all the time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and people like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's totally cool. <laughs> oh, the great taming of Hank Purse is one of the great stories of the online. <laughs> I haven't noticed that. That boy work. becomes the police. <laughs> Strong <laughs> curational hand. When did right. that happen? I missed that. I was sick <laughs> that day. Oh, if you have a hot stove report rules. suddenly turned into like being very official news, and oh, it was like you know, it was like reading Pravda. <laughs> you know? What I want to know, I I know Hank, is there a way, Hank, to get unbanned? Like if you have a tat that says Hank. <laughs> yeah, if you if you if you write if well, you are not you're not you're not banned on it. You haven't done anything. So no, I'm not. But you know, it, just it, people 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 can comment. You know. Uh, offline and sort of say, oh, I'm sorry. You know, that's, that's I, awesome. I got unbanned by taking 600 uncommon denomination uh, bumper <laughs> stickers and plastering his house with them. 
<laughs> so no one knows that I did that. <laughs> oh, okay. a Nobody will ever know. Here's a question: um, If you were, if you all were going to start blogging now, you know, because things do keep changing and platforms. Like, if you were just today going, you know, I think I'll start a blog. How would you do that? This is a question from somebody. Uh, a couple of people actually have asked that. Like, how would you, how would you start it? You're gonna just... Well, you could. Well, the fun thing is, you can start anywhere, and as soon as you get bored with it and discover there's a better tool somewhere else, you can go use that one. But, I mean, people are still using Google's Blogspot service. It's very simple. Uh, it Blogger. in five minutes you can have a blog and and publish to your heart's content. Other people use WordPress, which also has a free service. Um, there, those are still in sort of the traditional blog publishing model. Um, Tumblr uh, is a form of blogging. Uh, people who like sharing images especially like that one. Uh, Flickr is another image-based blogging, you know, service. So if you and were going to start today, what, which of all those would you use and why? Would I use? Yeah, if you were just going to start a new WordPress, blog. I would use WordPress, but that's also because... Uh, I got hooked on some of the customization that you could uh, add in, and um, if if I launched if I relaunched Philocrates, I would uh, install WordPress and have a lot of fun with that. Yeah. How about how about you other bloggers or non-bloggers? Patrice, use, this won't get you in trouble. This is a platform question. I use <laughs> Blogger. I, I I tried WordPress at the very beginning, and uh, I think I used WordPress for profit motive, and. Uh, but I found Blogger to be easier, and it um, it it works. Though I think if I was starting it right now, I would probably use Tumblr. Uh, really? It's just a cleaner a cleaner uh, thing, and I would also try to be more uh, visual than than I am, you know. Uh, yeah, and you can see what Rev Sean is doing with that. Um, yeah. uh, that he's really figured out how to make that tool uh, fun oh, really? to use. Yeah. Yeah. What's the name of his? Is it Rev Sean? No, I think he's doing um, Cabaret Church. Cabaret Church. Cabaret Church. Yes. Ca uh, and that's on Tumblr. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think so. I only read him on Twitter and on Facebook, so I, I didn't. Okay. The first thing you need to do is get a really good name. Oh yeah, that can take months. <laughs> really good name. <laughs> It's it true. could take months, or just call Hank, and he'll give you one. <laughs> yeah, it's extra. Yeah, yeah I've, got, I've got lots of names for you guys. <laughs> so one question I was wondering about while we are talking about starting a blog is that it seems like there are so many blogs that uh, I'm wondering, uh, you know, how your how a new voice can be heard or, or I mean. I, I would say uh, pretty crazy. Uh, number one. Go to after you have your blog all set up. Go to u u p d a t e s dot net. It's like u u updates, but there's only two u's, not three. Um, and get registered. <laughs> <laughs> Another anyway, great example of the, the Daily enough. Show. Well, but how confusing yeah. would that be, right? You know, three. Anyway, I know. <laughs> Trinitarians. We're not Trinitarians. We're, we're not Trinitarians, <laughs> right? I was uh, thinking, you know, if you want to start yourself. a new blog, Speak you can yourself. name it anonymous. And I was like, ooh, and you could have two U's in there. I'm really confused people. <laughs> um, Chris, but how to spell it? <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Heather Christensen, who does the aggregating of uh, the, not aggregating, the curating Curate. of UU blog posts in UU World, um, I, I believe that she always checks updates.net. Um, so I, I she that's is the actually one. even more thorough than updates. I mean, she. Uh, she scours the internet looking for blogs that are talking about Unitarian Universalism, even if they haven't ended up in updates. And so she's actually set up her own RSS feed that's that's in some ways uh, it overlaps with updates, but is a little bit different. Um, so, I mean, the, the the old advice is still good advice, which is the the way to be noticed in in the blogosphere is read other people's blogs and comment on them. Uh, mm -hmm. bloggers become aware of each other and that that's a great way to uh, to build up a network but using a tool like updates or letting Heather know that you've written something um, 
those are both both great ways to get in. Um, sometimes I think that uh, a hazard of blogging is thinking I have something very important to say, and you write your magnum opus and it's post number one, and then you don't hear anything from anybody about it, uh, and that can be um, sort of overwhelming and dispiriting. And I would say start by writing for yourself, um, aware that other people are going to be coming in, but you may not build an audience in a day. And you're, the, the best way to think of it is you're trying to enter a conversation. So you have to find a conversation to enter uh, and write write to other blogs, write to your community, write to Unitarian Universalists, write to people who aren't Unitarian Universalists, but but mm -hmm. think of what you're doing as uh, conveying something of your own ideas in a conversation with some imagined audience, and the more you do that, the, the better you'll be in a position to actually draw them into that conversation. Right. Yeah, yeah. Even once you have an audience, uh, I, Tom, I don't know if this is your experience, I absolutely cannot predict which blog posts are going to capture people's attention because I will have one that, man, I have worked on it for two weeks. I have researched. I know that this is going to break Unitarian Universalism wide open. It's going to change everything. Yeah. Nothing. Crickets. And then I'll just toss <laughs> off something and the whole world is wants to come. <laughs> I know what that is. Yeah, that's like I I see that. Uh, I, I I wish I could have a little uh, sidebar on mine. Uh, the twelve most um, uh, hidden hidden gems of my own blog. Well, no, I would love. I would actually <laughs> love to hear. I we would love to hear that from each one yeah. of you. Like, what blog that you've written has elicited the largest numbers of shares, responses, all of that, or the or maybe not the most quantity, but the the deepest conversation. What blog that you've written do you feel like has has been the most uh, transformative or important? Yeah, and I would love to get the conversations going again. Um, Chris, what was the one way back in the day before Lori and I set up Salon? There used to be something like a certain Wednesday of the month or whatever when everyone, when all the bloggers would answer a question. What did we mm. call that? Mm. Uh, well, there was a period where we had a coffee hour conversation question. We had a group blog called Coffee Hour in mm -hmm. like yeah. 2003 and 2004 or so. Um, but after that, when you guys launched uh, the salon, I don't, I don't remember what we called that. Oh, that's yeah, really there was so, there was something that predated Salon, and then Lori Lavin um, and I started mm -hmm. one called Salon, and just not enough people responding. Mm -hmm. Or they'd argue, you know, typical you use. We'd put out a question, and everyone would argue that it was a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I mean, I'm thinking, I didn't know about Coffee Hour, but that's kind of what Quest for Meaning's doing over at Patheos. We have a UU collective, two of whom mm -hmm. are CLF staff, but most of whom are not, who are just blogging about whatever they feel like blogging about kind of in the spirituality mm. channel over at Patheos getting responses and the person who consistently gets the highest response is Lynn Unger because Lynn has gotten really good at very quickly responding when something topical happens so yeah. you know mm -hmm. whether it's Trayvon Martin or you know whatever it is and those mm -hmm. are the ones always because of the tagging and mm -hmm. you know there's something about being in a public site uh, like mm -hmm. Patheos where if you can tag it and get it out first, you know that's really mm -hmm. the key. I think is mm -hmm. timing a lot with blogs. So I don't. Th I, I, think I, I would also say. Oh, I'd, I'd also say to um, uh, link all your social network stuff. I mean, yeah. while we were speaking, I like I took a picture of our screen and I posted it on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. You know, so so you, so that all that stuff comes out all at once too. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and and to be honest, have something to say. Have something that's also you know interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, like nice little updates are, are great for Facebook or or, or Twitter. Um, but if you've got something to say, like really, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, also, you, you know, you need a hook. You know, you definitely need a hook. Um, and I'm going to use this right now as my opportunity to say, and come check out my uh, Reverend Hank's Punk Advent Calendar. Every day I'm I'm uh, publishing stuff. I just I just did a piece last night on. Um, on uh, punk rockers in prison, and uh, talking a little bit about Pussy Riot, but um, and then and then going into some other stuff, and and ending up with uh, um, 
uh, uh, talking about uh, black and pink, uh, um, Reverend uh, um, Jason Lydon's uh, um, uh, anarchist uh, collective, uh, uh, you know, uh, work to abolish prison the prison system uh, in the U.S. So in interesting stuff. And I see a great question, Chris. What do you miss about your blogging days? Uh, well, I miss having the freedom to um, just think out loud in my own voice. I mean, I, I both don't have time to do that, and uh, it's much harder to do as the editor of the denominational magazine. Uh, people read too much into uh, uh, my own opinions, which are not what the magazine is in existence to propagate. So, um, so I, I miss that a lot. I miss the community that we had. Uh, there was something. Um, uh, there was something well, there, really fun about it. There were real relationships. I mean, there were real. Mm. Rela my my mentor today uh, is someone who I met initially blogging. You know. Mm. It's it's interesting to me in the sense of when you think about that blogging community and uh, our later discussion about beyond congregation community <laughs> and uh, that in some ways that uh, that was the beginning of this alternate UU uh, universe which was online and virtual as opposed to simply in congregational forms and um, you know I, I a long time ago I read the correspondence between two former ministers of my church who wrote to each other back and forth um, in the 1950s and uh, you know they wrote these short notes and they would p pass them back and forth and of course they both wrote with carbon paper and they kept their you know their mm -hmm. their side of it and um, you know so I had both sides and um, you know it would take them two weeks to respond to a short note you know and that was the extent of their collegial relationship and you know it was the kind of stuff that you know Joanna and I could do in, in three minutes on yeah. Twitter you know I mean really that yeah. fast or instant message and you go uh, wow uh, this is a whole other way of being in a, a religious movement I uh, agree you know, and we're especially only beginning to catch up with you know? right and especially you know I think the so the, the net the association of congregations that the connectedness I think that um, you know, the model of the UUA, with all due respect for people who still work there, is kind of really yesterday's model of leadership in terms of, you know, being discreet and disseminating information down. I think um, mm -hmm. what, what this, I, what I love the most about all of the social medias is that I think they reflect our theology so well in terms of, you know, I mean, I've done that talk on the five smooth stones of social media, but but just that you know, revelation is not sealed. That that uh, contact is voluntary. Commitment is a voluntary association. That you know, there's reason for hope. You can. Use, I I just think this is so our opportunity to get out there, and I it you know it frustrates me that I feel like you know people like you guys are so much more thoughtful than other people who have so much bigger platforms and. That's probably why I blog for Huffington Post and for Pathos rather than having my own blog because I'm having these conversations about white privilege and racism with people I will never meet and who may, you know, be other faiths or no faith. I don't, but to to feel like, um, and I know we've all we did, got different stuff to talk about, mm -hmm. but I think um, I really long for us to kind of, you know, and. You know, I don't know how. I don't know well, how, but to really be more effective about getting out of voice, which we're the mm -hmm. cultural creatives, and I just feel like, whoa, what? You know, there's so much amazing stuff that I think could go viral. You know, mm -hmm. so I mean, look well, at that. Part of yeah. part of what you're talking about has to do with how um, a writer or public person imagines their audience and the mission of their voice, and you know, Meg, you your ministry has always been extraordinarily public and you've always been alert to audiences well beyond a gathered congregation in pews and so something comes naturally to you that that is not actually cultivated in ministerial education for a lot of people just that you know 
public ministry is uh, your leadership of a congregation. Mm -hmm. That that's the way a lot of people are trained for it. It's not um, primarily how do you express liberal religious values to a broader community. I mean that that's a skill that people are learning on the job. Uh, you know something that that we used to talk a little bit about, and that I was certainly trying to get people to think about with blogging is have a public conversation in public mindful of a larger public audience. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's something that, that I was committed to doing um, and that I really saw blogs as a, uh, an end run around a bunch of our, of our patterns, a bunch of the ways that we had gotten used to doing Unitarian Universalism. Um, but that's not to say that that's everybody's uh, mission. I think it it ought to be more of our public leaders' sense of what their mission is. And it's something, Tom, you, you allude to that and talk about it a little bit in your article in the in UU World, mm -hmm. um, that it's it's the speaking to the public, it's speaking to the world that's, that's the fundamental purpose of the church, not just speaking to ourselves. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that's a leader's role, and, and mm -hmm. there are some, uh, I mean, I'm not a minister. I, I was doing mine as sort of um, trained for ministry, but I, you know, I, I wasn't thinking of what I was doing as, you know, me as minister wearing the mantle of ministerial leadership. Okay, uh, I, I have to interrupt and say, Chris, maybe you don't think of yourself as that, but you were a pastor to me, so. Well, prophethood, priesthood of all believers is uh, yeah. <laughs> something I believe in a lot. You know, but the, it's there. There are uh, individuals who have felt a strong calling to, you know, expressing some UU ideas to the public audience. I mean, that that's what um, Fausto was doing. That's what Chalischik was doing. That there were there were a bunch of people writing as lay people who were who who really were focused on saying something about who we are to the world, um, as well as just to ourselves. So I think that that's, you know, but that's a sense of, you know, what's your, what's your mission? What, who are you trying to communicate with? That's, you're talking about the hardest thing I find in the, in the blogging I, I do. Because trying to, uh, you know, I aspire in some sense to um, speak to individuals outside the faith. And to uh, you know, and to present a Unitarian Universalist or a liberal religious viewpoint into into people, um, particularly into individuals, and ask them to think about changing. But it's so um, it's so easy to slide back into talking to other ministers about what we ought to be saying. What we, ought, you know, what we right. ought to be, what kind of church we ought to be, and instead of being the kind of church that we ought to be, or being the kind of religious leaders we ought to be, it's so hard to get out there. There's some kind of like, um, uh, you know, I, maybe it's nerve on my part, maybe you know, which is like hard to see, but uh, you know, uh, there's some uh, way in which that comes up well, over and over again in the barrier as a barrier to what I'm writing. You know, but something that you're doing, Tom, that's worth reflecting on is it may be that what you're doing right now is very meta. You know, it's very focused on how do we do leadership and you're communicating that to other leaders. But one of the posts that you had up this week, you know, in the series where you've been um, sort of trying to talk, I, I've forgotten your phrase now, but you have this uh, phrase you've been unpacking in a series of posts. Oh, the um, infinite demand? Yeah, the infinite demand. So the one where the first half of it is you uh, sort of in a pastoral prophetic mode just conveying what that is. Mm. That's not a meta post. That half of that post you could go put on Huffington Post or send to UU World or, I mean, that that's ready to go to a very wide audience. Hmm. Then you pivot and you start interpreting it and unpacking it for 
mm. other leaders. Um, but those are two different things. And sometimes, you know, one of the benefits of a blog is you can do whatever you want, and some of mm. it can go very deep inside, and some of it can go very outside. And I always found it fascinating that sometimes I thought I was having a, an internal conversation, but, uh, you know, a whole group of people who are writing about it were my wife's Episcopal friends, not, you know, uh -huh. not the UU. Yeah. I thought I was talking about something else. Um, that can happen on a blog. One of the things that Meg has figured out with the Huffington Post platform is sometimes you have a particular thing to say, and it's not just for, you know, your immediate circle. You really have something to say, and that's the time you, you put that on Huffington Post. Right, I choose, you know, I choose what I say to whom, and but I think everybody's got different messages for different people, and and I think what's hard is that there's never pressure on ministers to get that piece out to the public. There's a lot of right. pressure to reach out to your congregants. There's a lot of pressure, you know, even a different kind, but even to be in touch with colleagues. But if you if you have a blog regularly, but there's nobody saying. The world needs us. Where where are we mm -hmm. talking to the world? And I guess that's kind of what I'm saying is, you know, yo, <laughs> yo. So I believe what you're saying, Meg, is that we should be missionaries into a larger culture. <laughs> I believe that would be what I'm saying. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Great think, idea. Those of us so called. Yeah, I, I think too though that that in um, uh, in seminary, you know, that that like in our preaching classes, we're always sort of taught that when you write a sermon, you're, you're so often you're writing. You've got a person in mind in your congregation that you want to hear this particular message, you mm -hmm. know, and um, and I and I, I and I think I still, you know, that obviously you don't want to sort of say, uh, if and if you uh, you know have red hair and a beard, uh, this sermon is for you to you know uh, stop. You know, C W. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, <laughs> but you know, so you try to make it universal, but you you really want to make sure that that you know that, yeah. that, that you've got a particular message, you know, uh, and you have somebody in mind. And you try to make it universal, and very often the person you've got in mind when you write it doesn't show up to church when you're <laughs> on that Sunday. Um, which is, and I think often, uh, often with with blog posts too, that you've got a certain person in mind when you're doing when you're writing something, um, and then you hit on something that might go out. So it it then it, it's, it's difficult then to go from like the the small you know to to a, a much larger you know conversation, or at least it has been for me sometimes. Yeah. This has yeah. been a very lively conversation. We just have a couple more minutes, so I want to give people kind of last call and say thanks to all of you posted questions. We got to a bunch of them. We didn't get to all of them, but it was really great to have you involved in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you, uh, Tim. Yes, you're right. It was UU Blog Carnival. That was the name of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so let me ask you this real quick. So should we have another sort of UU Blog Carnival where everyone's anonymous? Mm. Oh, I don't know. How does that work? I don't yeah. know. We can think on that. No self, no self promotion. You know, no what? worry that my congregants what? will see this. I'm not interested anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, Meg, I think that you know the thing that I think about a lot um, is that one thing that blogs started to replace was what used to be the independent UU periodicals, which uh. have largely vanished, and they were not an adequate replacement for them. And we are now a movement with very, very few platforms um, for conversations to grow up around. I mean, UU World comes out four times a year. Um, the internet, even for our highly connected people, is still not where most UUs interact with each other. They just don't. And um, as hard as we've tried to promote that, people are still connected overwhelmingly through their local communities, um, the print magazine, maybe some camps and conferences. And the internet is a, is a way, way back in the distant uh, mm. follow-up that, that highly engaged people connect through, but it's not, it's not a widespread venue first. So I still think that there's a there's a huge need for group platforms, you know, places where uh, the best blog posts were being collected by somebody. People talk about that as curation. 
so that if you're not um, itching to follow 200 blogs, but you really want to know where the conversation is, where do you go? I mean, we're trying to point to that with UU World's interdependent web blog, but we have lost the we have lost our forums. We have individual voices all striving to find an audience. Those are not a forum. A quest for meaning draws a lot of attention. One of the reasons is you've carefully pulled together great writers who write consistently, and it, it's it's a kind of magazine in a way. Um, we have really lost that, and wh where I wish people put some energy is how do you use these simple tools, these simple publishing tools, to bring a group of voices together, the way Red Pill Brethren does that a little bit. But we, we could be doing more of that, um, and that's, that's what I see as the missed opportunity. Well, and that's going to be our final word. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks mm -hmm. to everyone. It was a lively conversation. Yep. And thanks to all of you who participated uh, with questions. We will see you next week. We're, um, we're working on it. Someday we're going to be able to tell you who's coming next week when we end. <laughs> but we'll tell you soon. Bye. More fun this way. More fun. <laughs> Bye, folks. Bye-bye. Take care.